we talk about type two diabetes as being a reversible condition. And you would think that in today's world, it's 2021, you would think that that wouldn't be, you know, new information because the evidence has actually been there since the 1920s. I'm talking 100 years of scientific evidence that has demonstrated that you can in fact reverse the metabolic, uh, the, the metabolic collection of symptoms known as type two diabetes. Is it, is it appropriate to say, or in your experience, is peripheral neuropathy itself as a, as a symptom of type 2 diabetes, is that symptom also reversible? Or is that wow. a, a tough statement, you know? And, and Well, I would say it's a tough statement for sure. But what I would also say is that we haven't, we haven't tested the hypothesis that potentially we could avert diabetic peripheral neuropathy, because we just don't have any enough information, I should say, on that, right? Okay. But what I do know is that if we got individuals that were pre-diabetic and or at the time of diagnosis, the likelihood of them progressing through that causal pathway to peripheral neuropathy, wounding, infection, and amputation we would be drastically reducing all of that by about 75%. That we do know. Got it. So you're saying that's a preventative uh, intervention. You could prevent the development of peripheral neuropathy, but to your knowledge at this point, peripheral neuropathy, once you develop it, isn't necessarily a reversible condition. It could be, you just don't have the data in front of you. Correct. Got and it. so you start looking at different... Uh, you, you look at regenerative medicine. Is there regenerative uh, medical technologies in regards to uh, myelin sheaths or uh, Schwann cells or some other form of, uh, I don't know, artificial intelligence, wh whatever we want to talk about? There's got to be something that can help those individuals understand that they're getting to the point and or avoid ever getting to the point of having those abnormal sensations. Because once we are there, that pathway progresses very, very quickly. And so mm -hmm. if, if nothing else, we want to mitigate diabetic foot disease. We want to reduce the negative outcomes. And the best way to do that is to edu or is awareness and then education and then preventive pathways to reduce negative outcomes with or among individuals that have diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Just knowing is significant. Valid point. Okay, so, so here's a question for you. Um, back in 2018, uh, myself and Robbie and uh, one of our good friends, Tara, uh, the three of us went to a, uh, a health retreat um, in the South, in the, in the Black Hills of South Dakota. And there we got to communicate and, and uh, interact with a bunch of health professionals who host a retreat for people who are living with cardiovascular disease and diabetes, who come there for about a week at a time and learn a whole bunch of lifestyle modification and then use that experience to go home and continue to modify their lifestyle. And so the entire trip was focused on, you know, what is their process? How do they go about instilling lifestyle change? What are the psychological, you know, tactics they use and, you know, what type of success are they seeing? And inadvertently, while we were there, we ended up speaking with two professionals who um, have a lot of experience specifically with people who are living with type 2 diabetes who would come in experiencing what they referred to as it felt like these people were walking on glass. Like they would mm -hmm. literally, as they were walking, every step was so painful that some of them had to get wheeled in on wheelchairs. And they said, within seven days, these people are walking out of here with zero pain. And I was like, I don't believe you. That doesn't, that doesn't sound like it's possible. And they said, oh, well, you know, we're not, we're not trying, we're not in the business of trying to like lie. Um, right. But what we do is we do this thing called hydrotherapy. Hydrotherapy basically being alternating hot, cold contrast baths. And um, that is supposed to stimulate uh, nerve conduction. So the way that mm -hmm. they perform their hydrotherapy is basically by filling two buckets. One of them has water that is considered quite warm, but not like hot, hot. And then the second one is uh, water that's cold, but not ice cold, right? Right. And then what you do is you start by placing both feet in the hot water bucket and you leave it in there for exactly three minutes. As soon as you're done with that, you transfer them directly to the cold water bucket and then you leave them in there for one minute. And then you go back 
to the hot water bucket and you repeat that three times. So it goes hot mm -hmm. for three minutes, cold for one minute, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, right? Yeah. And they claim that by doing this over the span of a seven day period that uh, patients report back to them that they're, uh, you know, they, they feel a lot more sensation in their, in their lower limbs, their feet start to wake up effectively and there's a lot less pain when they walk. So my question to you is, number one, have you ever heard of this before? Uh, number two, uh, does this sound like something that would actually be effective for people who are experiencing peripheral neuropathy right now? Yeah. So this is a tough one. You got me on a spot here, but I, I love this kind of stuff. So, okay. you know, I have read a little bit in the literature about this type of thing going on. Although I would say I haven't read anything in regards to long-term follow-up, but essentially what we're referring to is a lot of uh, usage in regards to counter irritants, right? I don't know that this is vastly different than anything compared to like biofreeze, icy hot, capsation. So we go extreme warmth, extreme cold. You know, are we faking the, the peripheral nerves out essentially for lack of a better term? And a lot of people will report short term benefit, but I don't know that there's been any long term follow up and or any long term studies that I'm aware of, but that obviously does not mean that they don't exist. Okay, good. You actually answered a question that was in my head because obviously if you can stimulate, you know, reduce the pain sensation in the short term, that's fantastic. Nobody's going to scoff at that. But like right. you said, if two weeks down the road, a month down the road, all of a sudden the pain sensation comes back, then you don't have a long-term solution. So uh, didn't mean to put you on the spot here, but I just find it a fascinating concept because- No, it's, it's perfect, man. It's, <laughs> it's absolutely perfect. But, and, I, and I should say when at the outset, when we were talking briefly as well, when we mentioned- the utilization of uh, topical 8% capsation right. that was actually approved for and indicated for by the FDA, painful diabetic peripheral neuropathy just last year in 2020. And so obviously it's been demonstrated now in, in a randomized control trial, multi-center setting, that there's got to be some A, safety and B, efficacy associated with this. And so we have to believe that there's something there. I just don't know long term if there is significant benefit. And I would also postulate that by, and this is kind of getting back to your world here a little bit in more of a, a biochemical or, or biochemistry type of setting is in that short term gain and by bringing down our elevated blood sugars to where we have an A1C value of, or target A1C value of, let's say, 7.0. So we're doing a good job by definition, according to our internist, right? Correct. What about metabolic syndrome? And the fact that that wasn't even in the medical dictionary until 1998. Right. And the fact that individuals with metabolic syndrome, of which you only need three of the five variables, right? So uh, elevated fasting blood sugars, high blood pressure, low levels of good cholesterol, HDL, correct. Elevated triglycerides, correct. And abdominal obesity, correct. So even if our A1C value comes down to 7 and we haven't appropriately managed all five of those variables that we attribute to metabolic syndrome, is that part of the reason why we continue to have complications from the diabetes. And then one more quick point, from an ethnic perspective, there's significant correlation between type two diabetes and metabolic syndrome in African-American population, Native American population, Asian American population. What are we missing? There's gotta be some type of causal relationship there. Absolutely. Yeah. So now you're kind of going down the, the route of uh, there's, there's a genetic component. There's a, a sort of acquired genetic uh, variability between individuals that changes that, that, that what's what I'm looking for that uh, is responsible for part of the risk of the development of metabolic syndrome and beyond. Right. Because if we're managing those elevated blood sugars, fasting blood sugars, and we get our A1C within target value, why is it that our patients are still frustrated with us and saying, why am I still having all of these effects? Is it everything occurred prior to the diagnosis? You and I know that's not the case. Mm -hmm. But secondarily, even if you've rectified your fasting blood sugars and or your three-month blood sugar values via your A1C value, 
you still haven't hit the other four variables in the metabolic syndrome. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Hence the the idea that this is this could just be a band-aid. So in order to make it a lasting uh, solution, there's got to be some component of lifestyle change Absolutely. in order to reverse the metabolic uh, the metabolic dysfunction that caused the metabolic syndrome and or type two diabetes and or hypertension and or adiposity at the same time. And that's where the big thinkers like yourself are coming in. Right. That's, that's not at the hands of the podiatrist. <laughs> no, but you bring up a good point here. This is great.